their quest to understand the major issues of biodiversity, the Sedna 4 team heads to Panama, a paradise for plants and animals, with 1,500 species of trees, more than 250 species of mammals, and nearly 1,000 species of birds. Arriving from the Caribbean, the port of Cologne, with its giant cranes rising into the sky, is an astonishing sight. Panama is at the southern end of Central America, between Costa Rica and Colombia. This small country is famous for its canal across the Isthmus of Panama, a maritime passageway that allows ships to quickly cross between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. It's impressive because every year there are approximately 1,500 boats that navigate the Panama Canal to transport hundreds of millions of tons of cargo. The Sedna Four also traversed the Panama Canal. Dwarfed by giant ocean freighters, the sailboat makes its way through the complex system of locks that allow ships to sail between the different elevations of the shipping route between the two oceans. The narrow canal cuts through Panama's tropical forest, famous for its extraordinary biodiversity. And among all the animals of the forest, hides a small, fascinating creature, the sloth. The team stops on the island of Barro Colorado, also called BCI, located right in the middle of the Panama Canal. The island is home to one of the largest tropical rainforest research centers in the world. Each year, hundreds of scientists come to the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute to better understand rainforest ecology. One of the world's eminent sloth experts, biologist Bryson Voirin, awaits the team. So here's our boat right down here. Oh, great. And we're going to go on a little short trip around the back side of the island and go look for our sloth. Three toes or two toes? Ah, uh, the three toed sloth. Oh, yeah. So this is the more friendly type of sloth. Right. So here we are. I started with sloths because I've always loved climbing trees and I was really excited about working in the canopy in the rainforest because something like 80 or 90 percent of all of the biodiversity in the rainforest is up in the treetops. And sloths are a perfect animal for me to study because I can actually climb up the tree and catch them, and they can't run away all that fast. Now, I work a lot with the brown-throated three-toed sloth, which is the sloth that's common to all of Panama. And they're a very slow-moving arboreal mammal, and they spend their entire lives in the canopy. BCI is an amazing forest to work in because it used to be a hilltop before the Panama Canal got flooded. And now, with the canal, it's actually an island that's been cut off from the mainland. And no one is allowed on BCI except for scientists with the Smithsonian. So it's a really amazing place to work because it's completely cut off from the rest of Panama, and it's right in the middle of the Panama Canal. Because when they, they filled the canal, they didn't cut down the old trees. So right now, we're on the tops of trees. And depending on the water level, you can see they, they pop up a little bit. And the bad ones are the ones just below the water. And if you go over with a boat, you can hit them. It's like a minefield. You know, boom, hit the wrong one, and it takes the engine off. So we swim back. Oh, there's, a, there's a tree right there. Looks like a crocodile, but that's a tree. <laughs> Jean. I think there's a sloth actually right in the top of that tree right over there. If we go right through this uh, little canal, we can get to the back side of the tree. Boat actually, it's the easiest way to find sloths on BCI because you can actually see into the forest from the edge. Now hiking around BCI, It'll take me up to one week to find a sloth. And that's a long time to find such an animal that's so common on BCI. But by boat, I can find several in one day. This is really not an easy task. First, you need to locate a sloth from the boat. Then you need to get onto the bank and walk around trying to find the same tree. No, it really takes skill.
think this is our tree. Okay. Right here. And uh, I think I can just barely make out this loft up there. Like right at the top of the tree. Where? I don't see it. Just in the top of the tree, right in the sunlight, right up there. We have binoculars, and Bryson tells us where to look, but honestly, I never saw it. And what's this here? Huh? Oh, wow. Is it the... That's actually, uh, this is sloth poop. Oh, yeah. It's this really strange thing with sloths. They only go to the bathroom on the ground. They spend their whole life in the trees except to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so they climb all the way down once a week and go to the bathroom. A monkey, I guess a real monkey. It's normally dramatically slower. The running motion he uses, I believe is something he came up with himself. It's very unique. Bryson has captured a female who shows no sign of aggression. Go back with you. There you go. <laughs> nice. Well, here's our sloth. Do they drink water or just by the leaves? That just they... by the leaves, actually. It's, it's amazing that they never drink water. And in the dry season, I wonder how thirsty they get. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's doing yoga. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Females have a call. They're attracted to the scent of the males. Males have an oil gland on their back. And when the female smells the oil, they go yeah, real high reacts. pitch. Yeah. Yeah. It's another friend. And the males will hear that call and will spend days looking for the female. And what's the, the use? I know it's a ridiculous question, but what is the use of, of a sloth in, in the jungle? That's actually a great question. When uh, when Europeans first discovered sloths, they thought that they're the most ridiculous animal in the world. They have poor vision, they have poor hearing, they can't walk on the ground, they're totally defenseless, they can get eaten by anything, and they thought they were just, uh, just ridiculous. But when you think about it, they fill a perfect evolutionary gap in the forest. They actually eat up to 2% of all the leaves in the rainforest each year. Wow. So they have a huge impact on the forest. And just the fact that they're so slow and so, you know, what people would think is ridiculous, but they're actually perfectly evolved. The way that I study sloths on BCI is by using radio collars on them, and once they have been fitted with a radio collar, I can track their movements around the rainforest using an antenna, and that way I can find them over the course of different days. It doesn't move, huh? Yeah, she's very calm. She's a happy one. Sometimes the sloths will fight you a little bit. They can be feisty, especially the, the big aggressive males, but yeah. she's happy. So before we let her go, we'll get a weight of her. Equipped with a new radio collar, this female is now ready to return to her environment. Unwittingly, she will be contributing to science, helping Bryson to better understand how sloths move in the forest. The Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute is located on one of the islands in Lake Gatun, an artificial lake created by a dam on the Chagres River that was built as part of the Panama Canal construction project. We're actually sailing over a submerged forest. There are trees, railroads, even old villages under the ship's hull. It was all flooded when the dam was built. This man-made island is now a protected area, reserved for scientists. 
Biologist Megan Eccles is a specialist in bees. She knows the island of Barro, Colorado well. She's been coming here regularly to do research for many years. What's that strange noise? Oh, that's the mantled howler monkey. The males have these specialized vocal sacs so they can make that, that huge growling sound that you hear. And the purpose of it is to announce to other groups of howler monkeys in the area where that particular group is located. One of the biggest threats to howler monkey personal security is conflicts with other groups. So to avoid conflict, the males in each group will howl at sunrise, sunset, before rain starts, and when they move into a new feeding patch. And it announces to the other groups, hey, we're here. So you can tell there's several groups vocalizing right now because when one group announces its location, the others feel obligated to do the same so they can stay away from each other. reputation as the bee woman. So I collect colonies that fall in the forest or are located in inconvenient places, and it gives me a good diversity of species to work with. So I can look at community interactions, um, inner colony behavior, that sort of thing. Bees are pollinators. They're pollinators in most major ecosystems. Forest systems are dependent on bees to get their reproduction done. Flowers have to be pollinated in order to form fruits. Fruits are needed to make seeds. Without any seeds, you don't have any seedlings. The forest can't regenerate itself. You take away the bees, you take away the forest's ability to grow and to heal if it's damaged. It's been shown if you deforest anywhere tropical, stingless bees and orchid bees don't adapt. So even if you have intact forests on either side of a large area that's logged, the bees won't be able to make the crossing. So if you lose them in one part of the forest, that forest is going to be in trouble. Mm-hmm, straight ahead. It's right here. Right there? Mm-hmm, it's right here. Little yellow tube. What we're looking at now is a colony of a bee whose uh, scientific name is Tetragoniska angustula. They actually don't have a common name, like honeybees have a common name, because there are hundreds of different species of stingless bee, far too many for each one to have an individual common name. Um, this particular nest probably has about 1,500 bees in it. Oh, yeah. They're so calm and they're so serene. They're, they're a very zen little bee. And what is that uh, substance? The material that the nest entrance is made out of is actually a, a mixture of resins that they collect from trees, so just okay. tree sap, and also a wax that they produce themselves. Um, it's very soft, very pliable, and one of the reasons they leave the end so raw, mostly this yellow part is just wax, is because at night, this species will actually close their front door. They shut the nest entrance. And it's not so much to defend against predators as it is to defend against parasites, which are their biggest concern here. There are a lot of species of bee that nest in the canopy, which is a little inconvenient. They're difficult to see. It's one of the nice things about tree falls is they bring a canopy nesting bees down to our level, so they're much easier to observe. Now, be a little bit careful when we approach the nest. These bees bite, but they don't sting, so there's no venom involved. It's just like a little pinch. But it's a little bite? Just a little bite, But yeah. they're going to bite, eh? They are going to bite, yeah. yeah. Great. <laughs> I love jungle. So this is a colony of Scapter trigona. It's another stingless bee. Very social. They can live in 
absolutely massive colonies of thousands or tens of thousands of individuals. Um, they are a bit aggressive, much more aggressive than the last bees we saw, but they only really respond to something that vibrates or shakes their nest. It's a direct threat to their babies and their queen. How big it is? The, this the, colony, the whole, uh... it's probably several square feet, so very, very large space. They can get up to um, sometimes half a tree trunk if they're left alone and they're thriving. So that, those are the colonies that get into the hundreds of thousands of bees. The bees that are leaving are most likely foragers. You can tell which ones are foragers when they return. The uh, ones that are searching for pollen have little balls of white or yellow stuff on their hind legs. Bees that are coming back with nectar, however, they're not identifiable when they're flying. They carry the nectar in their stomach. The pollen is for the larvae, the babies. They need protein to grow. The adults are fully grown. They don't need the protein. What they need are carbohydrates, sugars for energy. So the adults only consume the nectar. Some are going out of the colony with something in their mouth. Are they cleaners? They are cleaners, yeah. There's house cleaning going on today, apparently. So probably they are expanding the inside of this nest. Although some of the other bees who are leaving are probably um, cleaning out the bathroom, so to speak. And what is the big problem with bees in the world? There's no one problem. If there was, we might actually be able to solve it. In, in honeybee populations, something has been occurring in the last 10 years that scientists refer to as colony collapse disorder. It's this mysterious phenomenon where all the workers, all of the, the foraging bees in a colony will suddenly disappear and they leave behind a healthy queen, healthy juveniles, but the workers are just gone. And without the workers, the colony dies. There have been a lot of studies that have tried to identify what is causing this and we're really We're really not that close to an answer still. There's a lot of uh, research that suggests it could be fungus, it could be a virus, but the fungi and the viruses aren't found in every colony that collapses, so it's still unclear. There's a very famous quote by Albert Einstein who said that if bees were to disappear, society would collapse inside of 10 years. Fully one third of the food that we consume is produced by bee pollination. So you, you can imagine we would lose hundreds of fruits, some vegetables, and it would have a huge impact, huge, huge impact on worldwide food availability. Prices would skyrocket for products like almonds, oranges, these basic things that people tend to grow relatively easily and consume readily. They're so dependent on bees that agricultural industry would grind to a halt in some areas. It would be devastating. The team returns to the canal to locate the female sloth. The signal from its radio collar will guide the search and make it easier to recapture. On BCI, I worked on the behavior of three-toed sloths, looking at which plants they ate and how much they moved over the course of two years. So here's where we caught her. We got four. And you can hear she's somewhere nearby. So that's the ping of her radio collar but it's not all that strong of a signal. So what we can do is kind of do a 360 spin. Ooh, it's a lot louder. On the island? So you can hear the difference in the signal intensity. So it sounds like our sloth actually might have left the one island and swam to one of these little islands right here, which is pretty cool. Are they good swimmers? They're actually really good swimmers, believe it or not. They swim much better than they walk. So a lot of times people see sloths swimming across the Panama Canal. So pretty exciting that our sloth actually sounds like she swam. The results of the big study is that actually that sloths move a lot more than we thought. They're not just sedentary creatures that stay in the same tree. We found that some sloths actually travel hundreds of meters a day, while others will just sit in the same tree for four or five days and then maybe move two trees over. So their movement is actually very different based on which individual it is. So she's 
right up there. I think I might see her actually. I think she's straight above me. Right above there. Wow. Where's her face? Her face, she's actually kind of sitting like this, upright. Okay. So this time, Bryson climbs up the tree. He has no harness, no rope. I tell you, he's a real monkey. It's amazing. Bryson uses a long pole to capture the sloth, which tries to escape. Oh, it's a girl? Yep, so this is our girl. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Attack. Oh, yeah, they will. They'll they will attack, attack, huh? He's such a small creature, but still equipped with, with pretty sharp claws. I still have some souvenirs from my contact with sloths. Well, they spend their whole life, you know, in the trees, yeah. so it actually takes energy to open their claws. They can keep them closed with no energy, so oh, they don't yeah. expend any energy uh, hanging. Do they bite? No, they don't really bite, but they'll definitely try to claw you. Especially mothers with their young, they'll be real defensive of the babies. Yeah. But she's pretty calm, she's pretty chill. She's lovely, she's so sweet. It's a really great animal to work with because you can hold them without sedating them. Mm. And so it's, for me, it's so special to be able to get to actually hold the animal that I work with a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So I get to develop a relationship with them. Whereas a lot of animals like monkeys or something, you get to touch them once when you initially catch them and then you yeah. rarely ever see them again. <laughs> Three point one kilograms. Mm -hmm. Nice. So she has gained weight since we last saw her. Oh, great! So she's been eating. Okay. Here you go. The female can now regain her freedom. In her own way, she is contributing to the conservation of her species by allowing Bryson to study her movements. The brown-throated sloth is not an endangered species. In fact, it is the most abundant of all sloth species. But other species of sloth are not so lucky. The team heads to the small island of Escudo de Veraguas, where Bryson is studying the pygmy sloth. Many scientists consider it the rarest mammal on the planet. But I'm really the only person in the world looking at sleep in wild animals in their natural environment. And the first thing we found out is looking at sloths, sloths in captivity sleep like 15, 16 hours a day, and sloths in the wild sleep nine. So there's this huge difference just in one species that we looked at, and that's the first thing we ever did. So I'm trying to unlock the mysteries of sleep in wild animals in their natural habitat. We arrived at Escudo last night at about midnight and set anchor, and then we woke up this morning and it's been really nice all morning. And we're gonna go out to the island probably in the next hour or so and go see if we can refine some of the pygmy sloths that I have radio collars on. Bryson and his assistant Sebastian have installed radio collars on 10 pygmy sloths. Now they need to find the animals again. The sloths that I put radio collars on are all on the, that side of the island right over here. And to get there, we got to go around the island this way, through the channel, and into the mangroves. Boat driver, ready? I'm ready when you're all ready. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Okay. We don't actually know how many pygmy sloths there are, but estimates vary from as small as 63 to maybe a few hundred. And these pygmy sloths have been cut off from the mainland for almost 9,000 years. And in that time, they developed a very small body size, so they're about 40% smaller than the mainland sloths. And it just goes to show you how quickly evolution can happen in species. Many scientists believe that the pygmy sloths on Escudo de Veraguas Island live only in the mangrove forests. 
the highly productive marine ecosystem that flourishes in the intertidal zone. Mangrove forests grow between high tides and low tides on the coast, and that is where Bryson has installed tracking collars. And just look straight in the middle of these branches. Straight in there, there's like a dark clump on the back side of the branch. It's right up there. You can see his face just looking at us. He's looking at us. Ah. Yeah. This is the same spot where I caught a sloth last month. So this could be her, but I, I can't see a radio collar, so I'm not sure. But it's not so tiny. No, they're actually, I mean, they can be kind of big but they are definitely smaller than the mainland sloths. And their skulls are actually much smaller and have different forms on the top of the skull. So because it's such a different uh, developmental size in the skulls, they're actually considered to be a different species. You know, they're marooned out here on this island. They have nowhere else to go. And if they're only living in just the mangroves, that's a tiny habitat for the whole species. And right now, actually, a lot of times, people cut down mangroves for charcoal, and that makes their habitat much smaller. So it's very difficult because they have such a small habitat to begin with. And every time they lose a little bit of habitat, it means less area for them to live. Really, every trunk counts in these mangroves because the pygmy sloths really do rely on them. For me, it's, it's so exciting to be able to work with a brand new species because most people never get to do that in their lifetime. And this sloth was just discovered 10 years ago. We're just trying to find out the basic science of the species. I mean, we don't even know how long they live. We really don't know anything about them. And so working out here right now, the main goal is just to understand a little bit more about their natural history and their life. Right now, I'm gonna to try to climb up a little bit and bring him or her down and just do a visual inspection to see how big it is and also if it has a radio collar. And if not, we'll right. just let it go. There we go. And if you grab him, oh. just like a baby doll from the back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like a baby. There you go. Okay. 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 Yeah, you have hey, to baby. Remember. <laughs> so that's a male, right? This is a male sloth because it has this patch right here, and this actually has an oil on it that smells kind of sweet, and that's mm -hmm. an attractant for female sloths. So they can smell that oil from a long ways away, and they know it's a male sloth. We found ourselves in an area of the island where Bryson insisted we go to greet a family of local fishermen, Nobe Aboriginals, I think. They're Aboriginal people who have been living on the island for generations and have really developed a kind of harmony with nature. They live mainly from fishing. They manage to sell a little, some fish, a few lobsters. But it's marvelous. When we arrived, it was the children who came to greet us. That's often the case. They were playing on the beach, and slowly we joined in. We spent hours. Often, contact between scientists and local communities is difficult enough. But there I found it really interesting, because often it's the children who actually introduce us to the adults. And then every time you can create a contact between scientists and local communities, I think it's really important. It was really a beautiful moment. Yes, a lovely moment. There's a sloth right there. It's a female. Yeah, she's eating a leaf. She's got it right in her mouth. Oh, she's got a baby. Let's see if we're real quiet. Maybe we won't scare her. Ooh, she got my shirt. Hey, come here. Oh. Wow, look 
look at her. She is beautiful. <laughs> oh my gosh, what a beautiful animal. Whoa. And look, she doesn't have a radio collar, so this is a new sloth yeah. with a baby. That's a good thing to, you know, see a baby. If, um, if there's less than 100, that's good news. Yeah, so that's one more for the population at least. Yeah. And a baby this size is probably about nine months old, I'd say. So that's a pretty big baby. Oh, yeah. He's just holding on to her. <laughs> All right, let's let her go eat some more. She looks hungry. <laughs> Come back over here, mommy. Come on. Right here. Let's see, she was right on this one. All right. It's one of the rarest mammals on Earth, and there's two of them right there. What a privilege to be here. research in working with pygmy sloths is to understand more about their life requirements, how long they live, and what parts of the island they really are using. So what I did is went out and caught 10 pygmy sloths, put the radio collars on them, and let them go back in their trees, and then we went out there to re-catch them and re-find them to see where they've gone in the past few months. And what I really wanted to find is that they weren't just using the mangrove patches, that they were actually using the rest of the island because there's only about 10 hectares of mangroves on the island, but the whole island is 3.5 square kilometers. So that's a very small patch of mangroves. Boop, boop, boop. That's Leo. Leo. So he's back over this way. Okay. Oh, there he is. Oh yeah, right there. Yeah, look at him, just kind of, he's laying right on his back. They expose their bellies like that and kind of warm themselves up. <laughs> Look at him just swinging around in the tree. In the mangroves again. Yeah, he's still in the mangroves, so he hasn't really gone anywhere in the past month or so. When I caught him originally and put the collar on him, he was maybe 10 meters over that way. Oh, yeah. So he's not moving very much. What's there? Another sloth. Yeah. Wow, and like five meters away. <laughs> Looks like a male, eh? Yep, you can see the orange on his back right there. Yeah. He's also a male, so Leo maybe has some competition next to him. Yeah. Let's see uh, if we can find some more. Hey, I've got nine more to go. Yeah. <laughs> the team traveled the territory, focusing its research near mangrove forests. In the days that followed, Bryson was able to find nine of the ten pygmy sloths equipped with radio collars. But despite searching for days, one was still missing, which worried Bryson. When you have a total population estimated at about 60 individuals, of course, each animal counts. We really covered the area, we looked everywhere, but to no avail. Really, I can't tell which way the sound's coming from. It seems to be all over the place. I wonder, it could be bouncing off of the water or the mangroves. Yeah. I really, I don't know. signal that we just can't find. I don't know. Maybe with you guys' help, we can go find it. Yeah. We should take the Zodiac. It's going to be easier. Before leaving, Bryson wanted to speak with local families to get some help in their search. Sebastian, his assistant, knows the people of the island very well. What she says is that she had a well back there uh, and the slap would come around because these are clean animals. They, they come down to the well to poop in the well. She thinks that the one of them that live in a the mangrove, they live in a the mangrove, but there is a lot more right behind in the jungle here. 
We'll let's check in the forest, huh? For sure. Yeah, definitely. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. What an amazing revelation. According to these families, pygmy sloths can also be found in the interior of the island in the rainforest, so their distribution is not limited only to mangroves. Of course, this information is crucial for our search for the missing sloth, but it could also become essential for science itself. So I'm marking the locations of the ones that I found so far, and number five is the one that I just don't know where he went. Hopefully we can find him. So Sebastian, let's check this cove right here, the Horseshoe Cove. It sounds like he might be right over here. I got him on the 900 frequency, so he must be straight back that way. Yeah. Okay, guys, we're gonna have to tie the boat. Yep. Good work, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. following with the radio collar led us into the heart of the island, deep into the rainforest. It was quite something. Oh yes, it was terrible. We, we sank deep into the mud. You could almost think the mud was alive. There were all sorts of insects that seemed to enjoy feasting on our flesh. I don't think wearing shorts was a very good idea, to be sure. Sounds like it's just over this way, I think. I think she's right up here. Yeah, you can just see her fur right up there. Oh, yeah. I'd like to get a closer look at her and just see how she looks and do a physical examination. It's been six weeks since I last saw her. Hey, Bryson, watch out, man. Careful. Find it break, man. Hey, buddy. Okay. Ready? Coming okay. here. Sweet. Great. Whew. Victoria. <laughs> hey. Whoa, you're looking big. Oh man. She looks great. Look at her. She looks very healthy. So she makes uh, quite a distance from the uh, mangrove forest to here. Yeah, she moved quite a distance actually, over 800 feet in the past couple weeks, which for a sloth, that's a big distance. When I first caught her, she was in the top of a very large mangrove tree. And now she's spending her time in this beautiful tropical forest on the interior of the island. So it's hard to say which she likes better. Yeah. But here she definitely has a wider variety of plants to eat. Yeah. Kind of like going to a all-you-can-eat buffet with lots of different things to choose from. One thing I think that this shows is that even though the mangroves are being cut, that may not be as big of a risk for the pygmy sloths. Because if they're able to eat other things in the forest, at least they have other food sources mm -hmm. besides just the mangroves. What is the size of the island? The island is 3.5 square kilometers. 
and only I think 10 hectares of that entire island is mangroves. The rest is this type of tropical forest. So they estimated 63 sloths being in this 10 hectares. So that would be something like six sloths per hectare. The island is 3.5 square kilometers, that's 350 hectares, that's something like 1,800 sloths, potentially, if it's the same density in the mangroves as in the forest. So it could be that actually the pygmy sloth is not as rare as we thought. It's still only on this one island, but maybe more numbers, which yeah. is good. What's the next step now? The next step would be trying to figure out how big the population is in the forest and actually doing an expedition out here in the middle of the island. But finding them is very difficult. Even if you spend weeks out here, I think you might not have an accurate idea of just how many sloths there are. Ready to go? All right, Victoria. Back to home, sweet home. <laughs> she's going her own way. She knows where she's going. She knows exactly where she's going. Yeah. It was knowledge of the territory by the local people that really guided Bryson on his quest and it opened a new avenue for research. This is interesting because if the population of pygmy sloths of Escudo de Veraguas covers the whole of the island, well, maybe we will be obliged to review the status of the species. And this is great news. And good news about the environment is really needed.